Snow is 20 pounds per cubic feet, and last night it snowed six inches. The roof only holds the snow, so we can ignore the weight of the beam and other loads for this thought exercise. We're supporting the roof on horizontal beams. Those beams are simply supported. They're 30 feet long, and there's a beam 10 feet on center. So the question is, what is the maximum vertical shear on the beam? The maximum vertical shear is going to be 1.5 kips. That's our answer. Now let's talk a little bit about how we get there. So in order to uh, really, um, really kind of understand what's going on, there's a couple of somewhat non-intuitive things you have to really just buy into. And you have to buy into this idea that um, columns push upward. So we have, we have a uniform load pushing downward, and we have a point load here because we have some piece of equipment um, and we have a uniform load. We don't, in our problem, we don't have a point load, of course. I'm just showing you what the uh, drawing convention is, the diagramming convention. And so equal to all of that weight pushing downward, we have an equal and opposite force pushing upward on the two columns. So each column is carrying half the load. So that's the idea that there's actually a force pushing upward. And so if you have, for instance, um, an eight pound dumbbell and you're holding it in your arm and you're pushing upward eight pounds to resist the, the, uh, that load, that force pushing downward of eight pounds. If I replace that with a 45 pound dumbbell, you're gonna to have to push up harder. You're gonna be pushing up 45 pounds. Uh, and it's pretty amazing that it happens to be exactly 45 pounds, but if it was 46, the, the, the dumbbell would accelerate upward. And if it was 44, the dumbbell will, would accelerate downward. So the first thing you have to kind of buy into is that columns actually push upward, even if it doesn't look like it. The second is that external loads on beams cause internal stresses within them. And that's really what this is all about. So when you have these loads on a beam, it's gonna cause stresses within them. It's gonna cause two stresses that we're most, most concerned about. One is shear, and that's this idea that you're pushing upward with a force here and here, and you're pushing downward with a force here. And so there could be a, a break here and here. So right in here and in here, and that beam could just kind of fall to the ground like that. So you can imagine if this whole beam was a toothpick and I loaded it with snow, you can imagine it may shear at the columns, especially if it was a short little beam, like a short little toothpick. So it would shear where the force is pushing up next to some force forces pushing down would cause too much for the beam to handle. The second type of, um, the second type of force we're gonna, uh, internal uh, stress in a beam that we're gonna be most concerned about is moment. So moment works like this. I know you guys know most of this. A uh, moment works like this. You have two columns, you have a beam on top of it. You have these loads. And the beam wants to kind of smile like this. And when it smiles like that, you can see how there's gonna be a crack forming at the bottom right here. So you can see that it wants to pull apart right there. And incidentally, it also wants to push together um, on the top of that beam. And so there's only so much that beam can handle. And again, you can imagine if we had a beam that was the diameter of a pencil and we loaded it like a normal beam, it might start, and especially if it was a long, longer beam, um, that may be what governs the, the, the break. In other words, the, the failure may happen somewhere at mid-span and it's gonna happen as the bottom cord kind of rips apart and the top cord smushes together. So that's number two, that external loads on beams cause internal stresses within them. And number three, and that's what this today is really about, is that these internal loads can be described by graphically clever, but non-intuitive graphs. So the shear diagram is actually a beautiful way to express something it's just not totally intuitive or obvious until you get good at it. And some of you guys are probably good at it and some of you guys are probably not. So let's start with the idea of like, when does shear matter? Well, shear matters, as you might imagine, when you have a huge force push pushing down 
and you have a huge force pushing up that isn't quite axial, it's not quite aligned. So we might have a tower building here and we have a bunch of horizontal uh, beams and we have a bunch of vertical columns and each of these columns is kind of pr uh, uh, putting a force down into the ground as such. And then we have this one, but we decide that in the basement where the parking garage is, we want to move this beam, or sorry, this column over just a little bit, this red one. We're going to move it over just a little bit because by doing so, we can get an extra couple of parking spaces in our garage. And you may think, well, that's not too big a deal. We're just moving it over a little bit. So we'll move it over a bit like this. And you see now uh, that it's moved over. But now you have all this weight, all this force pushing down here. And instead of it being kind of resolved to the ground, because this is a column pushing up here, so you have an equal and opposite force pushing up. And what you get is you get two forces that aren't quite axial anymore. And so you get the possibility for shear. So it looks something like this. This is, uh, let's see if I can hit play. Uh, this is my son in slow motion cutting a toothpick, right? So there's a reason we call scissors shears. There's a big force pushing up right now, and there's a big force pushing down right now, and it's just going to cut and kind of slice off. And so we're afraid that will happen with our beam. Now, in reality, that never really happens. Very rarely is your beam, uh, this is kind of one of the few cases where your beam would be sized based on shear. And so what we would need to do in this area here is we would have a column, uh, we'd have a column here, uh, we'd have a column here, that kind of shifted over to here. And we have uh, another column somewhere to the right. And we would have to thicken the beam to make it a tran this beam right here. We would have to thicken it to make it a transfer beam because now we're taking the force from the whole building and we're putting it onto this column and we're taking an equal and opposite force on the column. And we wanna make sure it doesn't shear, just kind of break off right in there. So there are situations where a, a shear will actually, the shear force will actually, um, uh, the shear force will actually uh, be the thing that governs. But in reality, um, it's pretty rare. The shear force is actually going to govern the connections. And in fact, from a structural engineer point of view, the connections are much more important than the, than the beam itself because buildings don't fail with their beams. Their columns don't fail, their beams don't fail. When they do fail, it's the connection that fails. Now, we as architects are more interested in the thickness of the beam because we have to deal with you know, running ducts around them and underneath them and so forth. So from the architect's point of view, what sizes the beam is most important, but just know that from a structural engineer's point of view, they're much more interested in sizing a column and 99% of beams are not gonna be their, their depth is not going to be sized based on shear. Now, of course, we don't want 1% of our beams to fail, so shear is important. It's just not important maybe in the way that you thought it might have been. So our question said that we had uh, beams that were 30 feet long and beams that were uh, 10 feet on center. And it said it snowed a half a foot. So if we pick, um, if we pick say, uh, this beam right here, so it's 30 feet long, 10 feet on center. And if we pick this beam right here and we just pick one linear foot of it, we get something where that beam is, is uh, taking care of the loads. It's taking care of the distributed loads, which are sending their, their, uh, their weight back to the beam on five feet on either side of the beam. And that's how, uh, because this is uh, five feet on either side of the beam, it works out to be 10 feet. So, as I'm sure you know, the fact that beams are 10 feet on center means that their midpoints are also 10 feet. And so we're gonna be taking care of a load that's five feet on one side, five feet on the other, or 10 feet long in general. And our, our, our uh, area that we're most concerned about right now is one foot wide. So we're trying to figure out how much weight, how much load is on one foot wide portion of the, uh, of, of the beam. All right. Now, we know that snow is 200 pounds per linear foot. I'm sorry, per cubic foot. Which means that if you just kind of look at our diagram, uh, which means that if you look at our diagram, that we have, well, it looks like we have about 10 cubic feet. 
10 cubic feet. So we have uh, 10 cubic feet. Hold on, let me go back here. I think it's 20 pounds per linear foot. Uh, 20 pounds. It's 20 pounds per cubic foot. I knew I did something wrong. All right, we have 20 pounds per cubic feet and we have 10 cubic feet because we have one foot wide by 10 foot long. So that's going to give us 20, sorry, 200 pounds per foot at one foot deep of snow. But we only have a half a foot deep of snow. So we're going to have to cut that number in half. So we'll divide that number by two because we have six inches of snow and we get 100 pounds per foot. Now, as always, don't just look at that as a number. That's actually a thing. Like that is actually a real life thing. So what does that mean? That means for every linear foot of distance on that beam, we have uh, uh, 100 pounds and we need to kind of deal with that. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, we say, okay, we have 100 100 pounds per foot. And I said it was a simply supported beam, which from a physics point of view means the ends aren't fixed. Um, and it means that you can kind of picture it almost like we just drop two columns, you know, in the ground. And um, we drop the beam on top of those two columns. That's kind of what it's happening from the physics point of view. So we have this 100 pounds per linear foot foot, and we need to then convert that into pounds, I'm sorry, into kips per inch. So we have 100 pounds per foot, we need to convert it to kips per inch. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna say, okay, we have 100 pounds per foot, and we want it to be in kips per inch. So the first thing we can do is we can say, okay, let's change the pounds to, um, to kips. So as a matter of course, we can multiply this by one and we can always multiply anything by one and it will stay the same. So as long as the numerator and denominator are equal, we're good. So we know we need to put pounds in the bottom because there are pounds in the top here. And then we can put kips, which is a thousand pounds on the top on the numerator. So how many pounds in a kip? There are 1000 pounds is equal to one kip. So we just multiplied 100 pounds per foot times one. But in doing so, we got rid of the pounds. And so what we're left with are kips per foot, but we want kips per inch. We want kips per inch. So then we're going to multiply that by uh, uh, something to get rid of the feet. So because the feet are on the bottom, we're going to put the feet on the top here. And we're going to put, and I know you guys know how to do this. And we're going to put inches on the bottom because that, that way we can cancel out the feet. And there are 12 inches in one foot. So we're multiplying by one again and we can cross out these feet as units and we wind up with kips per inch, which is what we wanted to begin with. Which means to turn 100 pounds per foot, we have to multiply 100 times one times one. So it's 100 on the numerator. And we have to divide by 12,000. And if you run that out, and welcome to play along at home, if you run that out, you're going to get 0 0.0083, and it's going to be 8333333, um, and that's kips per inch. And again, that is meaningful. Um, that means uh, that what, we're, what we just figured out is we figured out what is the load on our beam in kips per inch. All right. So when, I, when we look at um, a beam or start to think about beams in diagram form, there's so many different ways to do it. This is, these are a few of the most common. And so this one on top is saying, okay, we're gonna look at it in elevation. 
uh, we have um, we have uh, a column, we have a column, and we have a beam going across, and we have a, a load. In this case, it's a uniform load, and we're going to make it 30 feet long. So we're going to kind of keep this more or less to scale. So we're going to keep it at 30 feet. Now, the other way you sometimes see it, and I wish architects were not shown it this way, frankly, but the other way you see it is you'll see it with a sometimes a triangle on one side, and in this case, roller on the other. And a roller is what happens when um, from a, see, I wish they wouldn't show it this way, because a roller makes it sound like one end of the beam is pinned, which kind of makes sense, because we do that all the time, right? We'll have a, a column, and they'll sometimes be like a little tab, and then we'll have um, a beam that attaches to that tab with a pin connection. And usually there's a pin connection on both sides. So what gives with the roller? Does that mean there's usually a roller on the other side in a simply supported beam? And the answer is no, let me explain. So if we have a column and it's gonna meet a beam, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. This is a, a sculpture called Frankensteel, which is about two miles from where I speak right now. And you may recognize this from the videos. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at not a pin connection, which a pin connection and a shear connection for our purposes are pretty much interchangeable. But we're looking at a moment connection or a fixed connection, which for our purposes here are interchangeable. And the reason we know it's a moment connection is we have the, um, not only do we have the web engaged, but we also have this part here, which is called the flange. We have the flange engaged too. So there's bolts on the web and there's bolts on the flange. And you can see that's a pretty beefy connection. And likewise, this one here, it has uh, two, which is two bolts on the, uh, on the, on the uh, web, but it's also, if you look here and here, it's got a, uh, it's got a, um, uh, a welded connection at the flanges. So again, in the case of this one, if there is, a de if there's a deformation in the beam, if the beam gets loaded, it's going to kind of pull the column with it. But in most situations, although surely not all, not even close to all, but in many situations you deal with, you have a pin connection or a shear connection. And in that sense, typically the way that looks is the, the, um, uh, the web is engaged, in this case with three bolts, but the, 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 um, uh, the, the flange is not. Now, what does it mean to be a pin connection? Well, what I want you to do is I want you to take your arm and I want you to go, it's okay, nobody's looking, you're all at home. I want, you to, um, I want you to hold it out to the side, like slide it out to the side on whatever surface you're on, so desk or table, so that your hand is resting on the table and your, uh, 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 but your arm is outstretched to your right or to your left. All right, if you were to make the table disappear all at once, if I snap my table and the table disappeared, um, uh, what would um, what would happen to your arm? Well, if your arm would flop down to your side, then your shoulder is a pin connection or a shear connection. If instead, by making the table disappear, your arm would actually stay there. In other words, go ahead and now with your muscles, make it so that even though it's resting on the table, if you made the table disappear by snapping your fingers, your arm would stay horizontal or near horizontal. Well, then that's a moment connection. Now you think, well, why not just do moment connections everywhere? Well, there's several reasons not to, but one of them, and probably the most compelling, is that it turns out moment connections are more expensive than shear connections and not by a little bit. You would think a few extra bolts or a few welds would not make a big deal, but it turns out having really expensive welders, the kind that uh, deal with cranes and work you know, hundreds of feet in the air, they're very expensive and, uh, and, and having them weld each one as it goes up and shim it into place and kind of bang it and it, it turns out to be a very expensive proposition. So typically what we'll do is we'll have shear connections and then we'll have some kind of a, a shear wall or cross bracing to make sure the whole thing can resist lateral loads that come from seismic or from uh, wind. Anyhow, you may also be confused You'd be, you'd, be, you'd be forgiven if you were. This doesn't look like a pin connection. There's three things in there. You know, the way that I think of a pin connection, I think of your beam is here and your column is here. 
and there's some kind of a thing that comes out and then there's just one thing because one thing means that this would just rotate down if you remove the desk from your hand. And so to me, it seems like if there are three things like we have here, those three things should really hold the beam up. And the answer is yes, in theory, <laughs> but in practice, from the point of the view of the beam, which is like super long, having those three bolts, one right on top of the other, um, from the point of view of the beam, if the flange isn't engaged, from the point of view of the beam, it is like a pin connection. So even though it's not like a pin, it's at the scale that we're looking at in the photo, from the point of view of the beam, that's pretty much like one point and everything can pivot. So if you took away the other side um, and you loaded it, it would pivot down. And this is another uh, version of a, of, a, uh, of, a, of a pin connection or a shear connection. You'll note the flanges are not engaged and you'll note that the, um, that the, that the web is, is bolted with an angle. Uh, it's bolted to the column and it looks like a, a rivet is, uh, is keeping that, uh, that, that angle on, onto the beam. All right, now back to the roller. So, you know, you, when, when I hear roller, I kind of think of something like this. This is a roller um, that is actually underneath a multifamily housing building and somewhere where there's seismic danger. So we do have rollers that we, um, that, we, that we use on buildings where the whole building is meant, and you can kind of see in there if you look carefully, there's some going in the X, Y dimension here, and there's some, in, some going in the, I guess, you know, uh, YZ dimension there. Um, and the whole building is allowed to then roll back and forth. So as the building, as the earth shakes in an earthquake, you can have the, uh, you can have the rollers sliding back and forth and the building will be essentially less brittle and less likely to buckle and we can save some property and more importantly, we can save some human life. So when we look at this idea of a roller, we actually, if you looked at it in construction, you would probably find that it looks more like a pin connection. It looks a more like a shear connection. Um, but in reality, what's gonna happen is the roller is provided because from a physics point of view, the, um, uh, the beam is allowed to slide back and forth. Because if we had, from a physics point of view, if we had kind of a, uh, something here, like it was an infinite wall, and we had a pin connection on one side, and we had uh, another wall over here that was infinite and couldn't be moved, and we had a pin connection on the other side, that implies that as we load this and it deflects, and I'm gonna exaggerate the deflection so it deflects like this, like that, you can imagine that it can't deflect like that because that's longer and this, this whole beam doesn't wanna pull longer. So it's almost being held taut by, the, uh, by these infinite walls. When in reality, more often, we have a column and we have another column And even if we have pins on both sides, as we load this down, as we load this beam down, it's gonna bend like this. I'm exaggerating it, of course. But because it does that, um, now the two columns are gonna wanna pull closer together because obviously the beam that was flat, that was horizontal, that was level, is gonna be, short, is gonna be longer than the beam that's smiling, the one that's deflected. So as that happens, this column is gonna lean in, and this column is gonna lean in. And so that's what's gonna provide the roller. That's what's gonna provide kind of the flexibility and the horizontal motion when the beam deflects. I wish we would never, I wish architects would never even see that because it's so confusing because in reality, it's a pin on both sides, but in, from the point of view of physics, it's a pin on one side and a roller on the other. But anyway, this is what a simply supported beam looks like. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, we have the uh, force going up. There's another way of showing it. So we'll have the force going up and uh, uh, that's from the columns. And we have the, in this case, our uniform load going down. That's another way of showing it. Now what we wanna show is the, uh, is the shear. And so the shear is gonna be 
this diagram right here. So on the, uh, for the diagram, I want you to think of it as a graph. The x-axis is the location on the beam. So if we, went, if we went 10 feet over on the beam, that would be equivalent to this spot right here on the graph. Um, and so it's, it's, it's like the x dimension and it could be in inches typically. And so then we have the actual shear, the actual shear. Now the best way to think about the shear, I think, is to think about it like a piggy bank. And so what this is gonna be is on the vertical axis, we're gonna have the shear. Um, and so uh, um, uh, we have this huge, and anytime there's a force going up, then the shear is gonna go up, and anytime there's a force going down, the shear is gonna go down. So because we have this essentially reverse point load where the column is pushing up all at once, then the shear at that point is way up high. And that makes sense, right? Because we said if we, had a, if we loaded this up, you know, if we extended all of these, all of these uh, uh, loads, so we loaded up really high, especially if it was a nice short beam, then we would expect it to break something like there. So that's the shear. So what we're talking about in shear is we're saying in the cross section of the beam, if we have this big force going up and we have this big force going down, it's gonna wanna kinda split right along here and slice off so that this end whoop goes up and this end whoop goes down. So the shear is gonna go way up at first and then we have this uniform load going from left to right. We have a uniform load going from left to right. So it's gonna gradually, 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 gradually go down. So the, 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 the piggy bank, I like to think of it as a piggy bank. When we had the column going up, we put a bunch of money into the piggy bank, so it went up. And then over time, as we move from left to right, as we move from left to right, are, we're losing money from our piggy bank until we get to mid-span where it's gonna be zero. So we've put a bunch of money in by lifting upward and then we've taken a bunch of money out by over a distance, a little at a time, pushing back downward. And then it's the kind of piggy bank that you can borrow from your parents. So it can be negative. So then we're gonna keep, as we keep going, we're, we're still pushing down. We still have this load pushing down on the right-hand half of the column. So we're gonna to continue to push down. And so gradually, 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 um, we're gonna be pushing down until we get to, to the right-hand side. And now we owe our parents a bunch of money, but there's a column here on the right-hand side and that's pushing back up again. And so we can just fill that in. And what we're seeing is we're seeing the, uh, on the y-axis, now we can kind of think of this not as a beam, but as a graph where the x-axis, this dimension here, is the distance uh, here, this 10 feet, is the distance inward uh, from the end of the beam. And, uh, uh, um, and the height right here on the graph is the amount of shear. And you see the shear is highest at both ends, which kind of makes sense. So again, don't forget what we're talking about is we're just talking about what the forces inside the beam are. Now, how do you calculate what this V is, what this maximum shear is from here to here? How does one calculate that? Well, it turns out it's given to you on the test. Um, so you actually have on the exam, you have access to this. And what this says is it's a simple beam, so simply supported in a uniformly distributed load. And this should look pretty familiar to you. You have the load right here, um, and then you have the shear diagram right here. And it tells us that the shear, oops, sorry, that the maximum shear is gonna be equal to WL over two. Now, what's W, what's L, and where the hell did I find this on the test? Well, if you go to uh, my NCARB and you click over here, you'll see it's his demonstration exam. And many of you guys know this, I know. And then it's kind of giving you the beginning of the exam, what it really would look like to, uh, to sign up for it. So you click next there. And then you're tempted to click next here, but it says, no, nope, return to the exam. Uh, 
because it turns out you have to agree to all these things like I'm not going to share with anyone. I'm not going to hold end carb harmless. And then you say next and you go and the exam actually starts. And you can see if you move your cursor up here, you can click on references. And when you do that, you have acoustics, you have electrical, you have HVAC, you have plumbing, and you have structural. By far the most contents in structural. And then in structural, you have typical beam nomenclature, beam diagrams, and formulas, and you can click on that. And then uh, lo and behold, what you have is uh, the first one, I kind of skipped over it, but if I go to the next slide, um, the first one, let's do it again. You have to accept it. Click on references. And click on structural. And then you can either start scrolling down or you can click on beam diagrams and formulas. And you can see this first one right here, um, back up there, is the one that we want. All right. So that first one, that simple beam, looks something like this. And it tells us that this V is the maximum vertical shear, and it's equal to WL over 2. And you can look in the, there's kind of an explanation in, that, in, that, in the exam, in the references. There's an explanation that will tell you uh, what W is and what L is, um, and, and note that this L looks a lot like, believe it or not, that number right there is an L, but this one right here is an I. <laughs> so the note that the W and the I look a lot alike, just something to keep in mind. Anyhow, um, so we want to figure out the maximum shear is WL over 2. And W is the uniform load. So you remember our W, we figured out, this W is 0 0.0083333, and that's in kips per inch. And L is the length of the beam, and you'd be tempted and forgiven if you did this to say, oh, the length of the beam is 30 feet, and put in 30 there. But everything, unlike uh, some of the other things that we look at, like in plumbing or in thermal, there's no handy constant that can kind of make all the disparate, um, make all the, the, the disparate uh, units kind of resolve them, all the conflicts. So there's no, because there's not that, we're gonna have to put L in inches. So we had a 30 foot uh, beam and we can multiply that by 12 inches per foot and we get 360 inches. So we're gonna take uh, 0 0.0083, times the length, which is 360 inches, and we can uh, divide that whole thing by two, because half of all we're doing, again, remember, we're not just looking at numbers, we're taking the load per inch, and we're multiplying it by the number of inches, which is gonna give us our total load on the whole beam, and we're dividing it by two, because half the load is gonna be covered by this column, and half the load is gonna be covered by that column. So we wind up with, when we run these numbers out, we wind up with a maximum vertical shear equal to 1.5 kips. So 1.5 kips is uh, 1,500 pounds. And again, what does that mean? That means the force, the internal force right here, just inside of the column where the column is pushing up and the beam is starting to push down, that force in the beam is 1.5 kips and our beam, and more importantly, our connection, better be able to resist that without shearing off. All right, so uh, this is our next, that concludes, that concludes today's new content. A little bit late, but I'll get good at this over time. I'll get good at timing this. And, um, and our next one is uh, uh, snow is 20 pounds per cubic foot. And last night it snowed six inches. The roof only holds the snow. So everything's the same. Horizontal beam simply supported 30 feet long, 10 feet on center. So the question now is, what is the maximum bending moment in the beam? So instead of asking for the shear, we're asking for the bending moment. 
and next Thursday we will address that.